Hello everyone and welcome back to episode 2 of our Let's Learn series for Victoria 3 where we will be playing as Portugal and aiming to take it from a minor power to a major or maybe even a great power that it once was and rightfully should be. <clears throat> and in the first episode we went over the basic setup of kind of Portugal as a nation uh, as well as kind of the politics and just briefly over some of the mechanics of the politics, what laws we're starting with, just to get a flavor for you know the kind of country we are starting off with in 1836 uh, and here we are in the second episode i think just before we on pause uh let's get into you know actually go state by state <clears throat> excuse me and see uh you know what what our country has to offer and then and then try to decide on a strategic direction and come up with a plan as to how to achieve it in kind of a short medium and long term or at least pencil in. So let's go have a look where our capital is Lisbon here in the state of Estremadura. <clears throat> where this state represents 11% of our GDP. It's got 860,000 population. Population is growing. So that's about yeah, a sixth, slightly less than a sixth of our population. Uh, average standard of living is struggling. So none of this kind of matters too much. Something to note that this is the capital state and the site of a country's country's central government controlling the capital is of great importance during wartime and pops who live there have a greater degree of political strength by which to influence politics so this means that any pop living in their capital state whichever strata they are and whatever their standard of living they get a 25 percent bonus to their political strength uh so that's something to keep in mind as we build up our industry you know what kind of buildings we build what kind of jobs we're creating uh, you know, and who is going to get that political power bonus in the capital state. Uh, we also get a 25% bonus to infrastructure as well because it is a capital state. It is a homeland of the Portuguese culture. This has effect on migration. Again, we'll talk about that <clears throat> when it becomes relevant. Uh, market capital is also part of the Portuguese market. Uh, we have 100% access. Again, this means that we are fully satisfied or have enough infrastructure to kind of uh, serve our industry and get the goods to the Portuguese market. This is not the same as market price a a uh, access impact. MAPI, that was introduced in 1.5. We'll talk about that in much more detail later as it is an important mechanic. But right now, all this is, is that we're under the infrastructure cap, uh, right? So we have enough infrastructure capacity to serve our industry. Uh, these three guys are just kind of the representation of, kind of I guess, some of the common um, pops in this state. Otherwise, we have 44 infrastructure. <clears throat> now, what is infrastructure in Victoria 3? It is basically, again, like capacity to serve industries. It is used by buildings, right? So you see, uh, we have kind of two used by wheat farms. Uh, it depends on the level of building. So, so some buildings consume kind of one infrastructure per level, some two, some maybe more. Um, I'm not actually, I can't quite remember. But uh, yeah, for example, construction sector, we definitely only have one level in this state, but it consumes two infrastructure. Um, <clears throat> but basically, yeah, it is consumed to kind of su it supports our industry. Now, where do we get infrastructure from, right? Which we have 44 here. Well, we get it from 18.7 uh, from state, where we have three is base value, just an in-game base value of three. Every province, even you know, Sahara Desert has an infrastructure of three which I guess some very basic roads, uh, some such. Right, if we're a coastal estate, we get a plus two, so that's a five. And we get 10 from, uh, I guess, two levels of cargo port as each uh, kind of port uh, building, and we have two levels here, I assume, uh, have provide five infrastructure at the, at the kind of simple, and we can just sorry, jump a little bit ahead. We will go through the buildings we have in this, uh, in this state, but we have two level ports, as I mentioned. Uh, with a production level of cargo port as opposed to just a simple anchorage and that does provide us with uh, five infrastructure per level uh, so that's what it is yeah 10 from ca cargo port two from coastal being a coastal province three from base value so that's a five plus 10 15 plus 25 percent bonus from being the market capital uh, or the capital of our mark of our market and our nation uh, so that's one source, so that's from state. Now, how else, apart from ports, there are other buildings that can increase infrastructure and it will become important and pretty much ubiquitous and really the main source of infrastructure by mid to late game. And that is uh, railroads, of course. 
another source of infrastructure is just from general population and some techs that uh, basically add infrastructure based on population. So for example, here we have 25.8 infrastructure from POPs. That comes from 17.21 from urbanization. This is the base tech we have already researched at the start of the game. As more and more people move from living in the countryside to living in the in cities, their very way of life is bound to change too. And this is urbanization. As long as we have this tech open, we get plus two infrastructure per 100,000 population. We have 860,000 population, right? So that would mean we get, what, 16, slightly more than 16 infrastructure, right? 17.2 to be precise. We also get, excuse me, Tooltip is not working with me. It's so 8.6 from urban planning tech and urban planning tech. Uh, so by planning our cities before they are built, rather than letting them develop naturally, it is possible to create a much more efficient living area. Right, and here we can see plus one infrastructure per 100,000 population. This is limited. So we see here is plus 20 maximum infrastructure from population again. So these techs not only provide us infrastructure per 100,000 population, they also raise the limit that you know, of how much infrastructure can be obtained. So, you know, I'd say a limit of 20, that would mean a 2 million uh, population, we would get uh, 20 infrastructure, right? Because one per 100,000. So if we had 20 would be the maximum bonus that would equate to 2 million people. So if we keep growing our population in this state after that, without any other text, we would not get any more. So we would get up to 20, right? So plus one per 100,000, up to 20. But uh, yeah, various texts raise that limit as well. It is not infinite and it will run out eventually. And population doesn't really grow fast enough, you know, because you only get effectively here about three per three infrastructure per 100,000. It will not grow anywhere near as fast enough to keep up with uh, our pace of construction, most likely. Uh, so we will need railroads uh, fairly soon. Uh, and the last, I guess, metric here is taxation capacity. So what is taxation capacity? Each point of taxation capacity in a state allows for the efficient taxation of 10,000 POPs. If the population of a state outgrows its taxation capacity, the efficiency of all forms of taxation will be reduced. All right, and that means income tax, uh, poll tax, uh, consumption goods tax, anything. Dividends tax, uh, anything. Taxation capacity can be increased through researching certain society technologies or constructing government administration buildings in the state. All right, so right now we have, we're using up 86. Why? Because we have 860,000 population and 10, why well, we need one taxation capacity per 10. So we're using 86, we have 249 of capacity. Why? Because 100 is base value for everyone. Then we have that centralization tech, it was 25. It is a capital state, so we actually get 25% uh, taxation capacity bonus, which is actually not mentioned in the capital state description. And we have 25% from appointed bureaucrats law, right? That may change sometimes. And we also get 41.2 from filing cabinets. That's a production method of government administrations. <clears throat> well, or I guess, yeah. So if we go to our buildings, we'll go government administration. We have four levels, right? And that it produces, apart from bureaucracy, produces taxation capacity, letting us effectively service the population and make sure everyone is accounted for and has paid proper taxes. Um, so that is kind of the overview of any state. Infrastructure is definitely something to look out for. Population is important because that's kind of your labor pool. Infrastructure is capacity to actually uh, you know, process whatever resources or agriculture or manufacturing industries we might want to build in that state. Now, then we'd go to buildings and let's just have a look. So we have four different sections, urban, resource, agriculture, and development. Urban buildings are kind of urban centers, just kind of housing and you know, commerce buildings. Uh, trade and sort of services, I guess like pharmacies and whatnot, whatever shops people need. Trade center is, and, and urban centers get created automatically as soon as other buildings, and pretty much every building contributes something towards an urbanization value. We'll see that in a second. As soon as we hit 100, uh, you see for each four urbanization provides plus one urban center for the state. These get created kind of instantly. You don't need to build them. You don't need to pay for them. They simply get created and they employ a certain number of people, clergymen, shopkeepers, clerks, and laborers. They do also have, have production methods, right? So they can have state-run churches or free churches. Uh, you know, they can have sort of what kind of transport do they use, what kind of street lights, what kind of market squares, right? All giving kind of, and generally they produce services and transportation 
uh, generally. Now, trade centers are somewhat similar to urban centers where they, you know, we don't build them. They simply get created whenever we establish a trade route. So someone needs to service it and it will be the shopkeepers class working in trade centers. Again, we don't need to pay for them. We need to wait for them to be constructed. They simply spontaneously appear and disappear if trade routes are abandoned, right? <clears throat> they do, however, have profitability for a building. So these pops, you know, can go up and down in their, in their standard of living, depending how well the trade, uh, you know, trade develops. Uh, now we have a few manufacturing buildings, or actually one manufacturing building. We have glass works here, right? And that's taken wood and some dyes and produces porcelain and glass. Not profitable at the moment, unfortunately, but maybe that might actually change when we unpause, or we just maybe we need to reduce the price of wood uh, as, a, as that's you know, a key input here. Now, we do have military shipyards also here under urban buildings. And these is kind of a military building. It's a government run building. So we simply pay the wages and pay for these input goods in order to produce some man of wars, uh, you know, to uh, satisfy the demand from the flotillas we create. So if we want to have a Navy, we create flotillas of certain ships. And then we need to upgrade these guys to actually produce what either wooden hulls, steamships, steel hulls, or capital ships. Again, we'll talk about Navy in much more detail, of course, later. But it is a government-run building. But we pay for uh, wages and resources. They produce man wars. Um, actually, sorry, no, I'm wrong about that. Well, it's not a government-run building. Yeah, we can subsidize it. It's actually a commercial building. Uh, so it's a bit like small arms or artillery manufacturing. Well, sorry, scratch that. Yeah, they produce man wars. And sorry, I, I confused that with another building. And they simply, and here they are, they also produce 20 urbanization that I just mentioned. So if you build five levels of these, they would themselves result in 100 urbanization and spontaneously spawn or sort of develop an urban center. I guess a little town or expand, you know, Lisbon, you can think of it like that. Now, shipyards, uh, these are similar to military ships, in that they obviously, they get paid, there's workers, they get paid wages, they consume some input goods and they produce clippers. Clippers are simple kind of merchant fleet to service our need for convoys, for trade, uh, and such. And, and such, such. Uh, it can be can go from wooden ships to reinforced wooden ships to steamships and arc weld, welded steamships. I don't think that actually, like, that's sort of just thematic, right? Ultimately, we always just produce clippers and you know, we actually here we produce steamers. Uh, so I guess, yeah. I mean, uh, so these clippers would be mostly consumed by ports, which are government building, right? So ports, as I just mentioned, they provide infrastructure. So we have two levels, that's 10 infrastructure, and they use clippers though, so, right? So they need to buy clippers in order to be able to actually produce these. Just like a bit like a construction sector where it's a government run building, it's always kind of a deficit because it doesn't make a profit. We simply pay the wages of the people and buy enough goods to actually produce convoys, infrastructure, and some urbanization. <clears throat> You can here switch what kind of ports they are, right? Whether they're cargo ports, industrial ports, modern ports. And you can see moving up to industrial and modern ports requires steamers, uh, you know, a kind of a more advanced version of merchant ships rather than clippers. So there's the shipyards. Now we can also build all sorts of things here, of course, all sorts of manufacturing buildings all go into urban areas. In terms of resources, this is important to pay attention to as each state, you know, is endowed in different ways endowed with uh, different resources, right? It might have coal, it might not. It might have iron, lead, uh, sulfur, rubber, oil. You know, it either has it or it doesn't. Sometimes there's a little window, I guess we'll see that in our colonies of discoverable, re discoverable resources kind of available. That means we don't yet know, but it might have rubber, oil, or some other stuff, but we need to research some text and wait until our geologists actually happen upon a deposit of uh, that particular um, natural resource. Now here in Estremadura we got pretty much nothing. We have fishing wharves and logging camps. So we have potential level 8. Again also depends I guess on the length of the coastline. You know how, how, how much fish there is in the sea here. But for us here it's uh, up to 8 and we already occupied 3 levels of that. Uh, into the logging camps we can build a maximum of 4 here. That just again represents how much forest there is perhaps in the state. So we have just potential for just simple resources, fish and logging camps. Uh, in terms of agriculture, this is limited by arable land. And here we have, 
I guess, 30. So two, two that we already use for livestock, lunches, and wheat farms, and 26 subsistence farms. So all arable land is always occupied, as I guess, as long as there is enough population, right? So peasants are the people who work on subsistence farms, but this is limited by arable land, right? Uh, and as we build other agricultural buildings, we take take up that arable land with other buildings or as peasants upskill into other jobs and start working in manufactories or resource buildings they will also abandon their subsistence farms uh, i guess if we wait long enough and our population grows and then i know other jobs and, and people can't migrate to other states they will again build up these subsistence farms uh, so there we are so we have potential for livestock ranches wheat bananas cotton tobacco and vineyards in estramadura uh, yeah, decent amount of potential here and lastly, we have development buildings. So these are all government run. So we see this uh, sort of little symbol, right? The wages and eventual material expenses will be paid from your treasury. The wages will be moving towards the average wages in the state, right? Uh, again, we'll talk about wages in much more detail later. It's a separate and important topic. Now, what do we have in development buildings? We've got some government administration, which we have already seen, producing some bureaucracy and taxation capacity by taking, employing some bureaucrats, clerks, and clergymen, and taking some, and buying some paper for them. We have naval bases. So these, this is the military building that's government run. So that's what I confuse military shipyards with. So they take man o' wars that the commercial buildings produce, and we also pay them some wages, and they produce for us some flotillas, right? And we see, for example, they produce three flotillas. We then can determine in the naval interface here in the military as to what kind of ships we're actually running. Right now we have, and the game is separated into light ships and heavy kind of capital ships, right? And we have man of wars as our technology, which will you know, later move to kind of steel battleships. And we have frigates as only lightly armed sailing ship and mostly used for scouting, patrolling, and escorting missions, right? Whereas Man of War's sailing ship armed with cannons. There we are. So I'm training it again. We'll talk about military in more detail when the time comes. But for now, we also have some barracks here. Again, they work similarly. We pay wages. We get we buy some supplies for our kind of men. And here it produces two battalions, a level two barracks. So it produces two battalions, each of 1,000 1, men strong. Uh, and they go into army. It takes time to train these up. This is what the training rate, training rate refers to. So you don't just instantly get a thousand men, nor do you get it in one week. It takes quite a bit of time to actually build up. The rate at which we build up can be increased by changing this production method and effectively employing more officers versus servicemen, which makes our uh, army kind of faster to train. It is faster than to train replacements for casualties in a war. Um, yeah. And, and that is really the main effect. That's what the training rate refers to. Uh, and then we also have ports. Again, we talked about that. Provide infrastructure, construction sector. We also talked about, I think, a little bit. Uh, we'll talk about that in more detail as we will open up probably with the construction sector. But effectively, we pay wages. It takes up some wood and fabric because we are currently on a wooden building production method. Right? It uses two infrastructure <clears throat> and it gives us two construction capacity which is used to construct buildings it is 0.2 state construction efficiency so particularly within that state if we actually use this construction sector it works for the entire economy but if we do happen to construct a building within estramadura we'll get the 0.2 uh, per level uh you know and, and that, that bonus per level goes up with production methods so we would get 0.4 at the next level so we're kind of more efficient it's effectively like throughput kind of thing for this particular state there's 10 percent mortality of laborers uh, in, uh, in, in embedded in this yeah and it's true for iron frame buildings pretty much for anything yeah so all generally construction is a dangerous sector right fatalities are more common uh, and therefore anyone who works in this building has their mortality rate increased by 0.1 percent and it adds five urbanization again we've talked about all of this each building has a certain workforce right uh, typically some lower like lower strata mid, and at least middle strata to kind of run it. I guess we have bureaucrats as the middle strata running this um, uh, enterprise and we have some clerks to kind of administer things and obviously mostly laborers to actually do the day-to-day -day grunt work. Um, so there we are. Construction, we can also obviously this construction sector, power plants for later on, railways, skyscrapers, universities, all government-run buildings are uh, are put under development type buildings. Again, agriculture for any agricultural buildings, 
uh, and resources for things like wood, coal, iron, etc. And urban buildings for manufactories and urban centers and trade centers. Uh, there we are. But something to note, yeah, not a lot of resources for us here, unfortunately. If we look at second state, Alenteo. What is that? That's 4% of our GDP only. I guess mostly because the population is only 370,000, not a lot. It is growing. Luckily, standard living is fine. It is an incorporated state. <clears throat> uh, it's part of the Portuguese market. We're 100% access because our infrastructure usage is below our cap. Okay, plenty of taxation capacity. We have to keep an eye on infrastructure here, uh, right? Because, yeah, not a lot here. Now, let's talk about maybe incorporated states versus unincorporated states. Now, incorporated states is states that are fully integrated into a country. Pops and incorporated states pay taxes, gain access to benefits from institutions, and participate fully in the country's political system. Unincorporated states can be incorporated through a sometimes lengthy process. And again, as we look over our other states, we'll see what an un unincorporated state kind of looks like, what the total for that is. But basically, this is, you know, fully part of our nation, fully belongs to us, although unincorporated states obviously all fully belong to us. So no, you know, if someone wants to take it over, they need to declare war. But this is fully serviced, uh, you know, with government institutions um, uh, as opposed to an unincorporated state. Now, let's have a look at buildings here. So no urban centers, so very undeveloped. Now, in terms of resources here, there's a bit more. We actually have coal, iron and sulfur here. So very good. This will be very important for early uh, and really kind of later industrialization. This iron will be used a lot, coal we're going to need a lot, sulfur is very important for fertilizers and explosives. Iron and coal together make a lot of things, including steel, which then steel and coal make other things that are very important. Uh, so, yeah, key state for us, this is important, all right? Unfortunately, it doesn't have a very big population, nor does it have a lot of infrastructure. So we'll have to be careful as to what we build here. So even though, for example, it can take logging camps, I wouldn't maybe spend... Okay, we do have 66,000 peasants here. So, you know, a decent labor pool. Uh, each building employs roughly 5,000 people, let's say. So we can build, what, uh, uh, something like 10, 13, 13 buildings here, right? To, to be fully employed uh, as up, uh, peasants upskill into laborers. So 15 buildings, right, if we think about it that way. Now, we don't actually have nearly enough infrastructure to support 15 buildings. That is an issue. So we have to be cognizant, but this will be important. I would save this state for a little bit later, and I would focus here purely on coal and iron and sulfur so that we have a secure domestic supply of these key resources needed for early industrialization. Uh, and they will need, be needed really for through mid-game as well. Now, in terms of agriculture here, we've got livestock ranches, bananas, vineyards, wheats, and subsistence farms of 22, so 25 arable land. Um, okay, development wise, we've got some barracks and a naval base. So yeah, not very developed state, but a lot of potential, very fact, crucial to our industrialization efforts. Let's go north, and here we have a state of Beira that has 843,000 GDP, so 24 a quarter of our GDP is in this state. And wow, 1.6 million people live here. Uh, population is growing that's good uh, okay again in with 100 infrastructure access this is all kind of clear infrastructure well below cap taxation capacity interestingly is uh, approaching the cap because we have a lot of population uh right yeah and i guess not a lot of government administration here so something to keep an eye out again population doesn't grow that quickly but again something to keep an eye on in terms of buildings let's have a look we have two urban centers, some trade centers here, and textile mills. Um, okay, two textile mills. Uh, okay, in terms of resources, we have fishing works and logging camps, not much else. Uh, we have livestock ranches, wheat farms, vineyards, bananas, cotton, tobacco. Uh, wow, a lot of arable land. This is a big state. 51, effectively, and what are seven and nine, so 60 arable land. This is a a big state that can support, I guess, not surprising, it has so much population historically, since, yeah, so obviously a lot of arable land here to actually support those peasants. Uh, in terms of development, we've got barracks, two levels of barracks, two levels of administration, and yet it's not quite, or well, almost not enough. So keep an eye on this. We have a naval base here of two, and we have a port of uh, tier one. Now we do at the bottom, we can see here job seekers, not quite so important, so it's just people who 
are potentially looking for a better job, that's good. Qualifications means, okay, there's plenty of qualifications for each uh, for each uh, profession, which means people are ready to upskill if we are going to build a building. So again, that's good. We'll go over that in more detail uh, later. Now we do have 242,000 peasants, so plenty of labor. And on top of that, we even have 34,000 unemployed who are obviously desperate to get a job. So from that, it would tell me that if we do build anything from the start, and that was, uh, as I said, when we were looking over our population in episode one, this is our number one priority is to employ the unemployed. Why? Because unemployed have a standard of living of less than five. And that means their mortality rate is higher than their birth rate. And that means they're slowly dying out. And that's mean we're losing pops, which is never good. It also drags down our kind of overall, obviously, uh, pop growth rate. And also these pops, you know, the longer they remain in starvation, obviously, they become very radical very quickly. And there's not really enough of them to really cause any major trouble. But we don't want to waste resources unnecessarily. It will also create, uh, you know, a good amount of loyalists as we put them in jobs. So, you know, easy pickings here. I would say we'll probably start uh, our construction efforts in Beira. And in fact, you know, thinking about the fact that, okay, we have, we're running a surplus of 1.95 thousand, right? Now, what can we use that money for? We can use that to uh, actually finance our construction. We can use it to finance armies, navies, uh, maybe government administrations or any government run buildings, railroads for extra infrastructure. Right now, we do have a surplus, so that's good. And we even have quite a, you know, we have our gold reserves half full. So I would go ahead and just schedule another construction sector in Beira to speed up construction. Or, hmm, or perhaps, let's think about this. In fact, I would say if we go to our logging camps, right, so we saw, so the reason I hesitate, right, but that would be a good idea. You know, let's just talk this through. Why would uh, building a construction sector be a good idea? Because it only requires 100 construction, so it would be very quick to build, right? We kind of have construction capacity of 12, so 10 weeks. All uh, right, it's quick to build. Uh, okay, we will spend 3,000 on construction. So we'll go into deficit by 1,000. That's unfortunate, but we do have the kind of the gold reserves to last us through while we'll build other buildings. Um, but what will it give us? It will give us plus two construction. So that's a two increase on 12. So that's a... A 12, that's what, um, 8%? 8% increase in our construction speed. Um, sorry. Sorry. 2 or 12 is a 6, rather. Sorry. Sorry about that. A 6, a 16%, yeah, that's what I thought. Uh, sorry. Uh, 1 over 12 would be an 8th. 2 over 12 is a... Uh, it's 1 over 6. It's a, yeah, sorry. A 16% increase. So pretty good, yeah, 16% increase, but what would be, so quick to build, so we will immediately employ, well not immediately, sorry, but very quickly employ 5,000 of our unemployed, right, into a construction sector. It will, however, create demand for fabric and wood, which, uh, if we look at our logging camps, our economy is already kind of struggling a little bit, because wood is very expensive, what is it, and what does that translate to now? For logging camps, that's very good, it means this building is very profitable, and whoever owns it, which is currently a thousand shopkeepers that own and operate logging camps, you know, they are probably very well off, right? They're affluent. They have a certain living of 34. Wow. And that's kind of a, pretty much equivalent to upper strata, right? Just for reference, just quickly, if you go detail list, our aristocrats have, a, have an affluence level of 30 on average. Wow. Right. So these, I mean, okay, there are some... Okay, there's some aristocrats, UE Catholics in Macau that are even more affluent at 37. But you can see these shopkeepers are making a killing on these logging camps because our economy is starved of wood. Therefore, adding another construction sector would simply, it might even push us to a shortage of wood, which will not be good. That means all buildings that require wood would suffer a throughput penalty, as it's basically not enough wood. Um, so perhaps, and okay, the 16% increase to construction is nice, but is it really worth uh, running a deficit and potentially causing problems, you know, also raising the price of wood, right? Because 
the way you know our economy would respond if we build a construction sector now with an extra 75 demand for wood right the way it will respond is by increasing the price of wood further right until there is you know the prices the prices generally vary between minus 75 percent and plus 75 percent to satisfy demand but if the demand for a good uh is more than double of our supply right which can also be uh, supplemented with trade but let's say we don't trade from our domestic supply then there will be a shortage and a shortage uh starts to give people penalty whereas Without a shortage, if it's just high price, it just makes the building less profitable. So perhaps, um, okay, this will take two, 200 construction to build up a... Uh, yeah, we take 200 construction to build a logging camp here, and that will produce 30 wood. So perhaps, you know, we kick off with a logging camp, right? build maybe even a couple and perhaps then we build a construction sector afterwards all right that means you know and probably could probably then just go ahead and max out logging camps so that you know this together so if these three levels plus construction we create twenty thousand jobs so that will mostly deal with the unemployed plus you know provide our market with more log uh, more wood reducing the price of wood making buildings other than well, obviously making logging camps more profitable so these guys will suffer right these shopkeepers we can keep an eye on them but their affluence level will go come down however uh our government finances will benefit because we will be financing construction of you know buildings that we order to be built and we will have to pay the market price for wood if that price goes down we'll pay less right this is where we looked at budget construction goods 3,000, right? We, we spent 2,500 on wood. This can come down, right? It doesn't have to be 2,500. Two we just pay the market price. The more wood we actually put into our economy, price will adjust. Uh, also, buildings like Glassworks, for example, here, uh, you know, they're unprofitable. Even though, well, I guess, yeah, these goods are pretty cheap, so there is not a lot of demand for porcelain or glass. But I think at least, you know, our dyes are super cheap. Perhaps if we reduce... And look, we're on the verge of being profitable. So when we build more logging camps and build additional, uh, you, know, you know, create additional wood supply, we probably would build, uh, would, would be able to have this building uh, be profitable. So I would actually even go ahead and just schedule one more logging camp here just to have some local supply of wood. Again, we will talk about why is it, you know, does it matter whether we build logging camps in Bay Area here? And it, yes, it does matter. Uh, and I'll explain why in detail a bit later. But let's do queue these up. You know, that will kind of probably take us a year, even 18 months to build three levels of logging camps, a construction sector, and another logging camp in Estremadura. But that will deal with the unemployed, deal with high price of wood for our, uh, so help, you know, alleviate the strain on our budget and help make some buildings like Glassworks profitable, perhaps, by reducing the price of wood. All right, so that's kind of our opening strategy in terms of our economy. Now, let's quickly have a look at whatever what other territories we hold. Just very quickly, so Azores, 3% of our GDP, 120,000 population. It is an unincorporated state, so let's go ahead and just read that out. A state that is within a country's domain, but considered the territorial holding of frontier beyond the reach of institutions and government. Pops who live in unincorporated states are disenfranchised and do not contribute much political strength to their interest groups, nor can they vote in elections. On the upside, for them, they are exempt from taxation. So conversely, the way you should read this is for us, okay, we're not taxing these people, so we're missing out on tax revenue. But uh, at the same time, we don't really care what these people think, uh, right, what their political affiliations are. They don't play a part in our country's politics. Can it be good or bad? Depends. You know, we'd have to assess what who actually lives here and who would they support, right? Uh, when we make a decision whether we incorporate these or not. We can also live who lives here, you know, how much money do they make? And, uh, you know, is it worth taxing them, right? Or is it worth making this trade-off? We'll think about that. So unincorporated states do not cost bureaucracy to maintain as well. That's another benefit for us. It means we don't have to build a government administrations, right, in, our, you know, in other states. As taxes are not collected and institutions do not provide any benefits here. So again, the healthcare system that we would like to uh, improve. Uh, in fact, we already have a le one level of uh, healthcare. Um, 
healthcare institution, right? That doesn't apply here. So we don't get that reduction in mortality and an increase in minimum standard of living here. Um, because, you know, these are unincorporated states. Unincorporated states can be incorporated, which will put it under the direct management of the country's central authority. Unincorporated states are subject to the following effects. Minus 10% market, market access price impact, minus 50% Universal pop political strength. Uh, that's that. That's what they talk about. They're disenfranchised. Uh, well, they can't vote in any case. But we don't have any voting system. But even from their wealth, you know, they generally have a big penalty. Minus fifty percent. That's a massive penalty. Market price act price impact. We'll talk about that in more detail separately. But effectively means local prices differ from national prices. So the building here. If we built logging camps, it wouldn't receive the national price, even though there is like say high demand in these provinces, let's say in Beira or in Estremadura, logging camps here would not quite benefit from that high price. They would benefit from something like 95, 90% of that price. So it's always pretty high. I think it can be a minimum of sort of like 75 and goes up from there, but there is a differential. Um, yeah, so there we are, unincorporated state. They also get minus 20% infrastructure, so we're struggling a little bit with infrastructure here. Well, not struggling, but at least we're sort of 50% full. Minus 50% conscriptable battalion, so we can't really conscript a lot of people into an army in the event of a war here. They get minus 10% manufacturing industries throughput. Uh, so yeah, not very efficient to build manufacturing industries here. Minus 10% government structures throughput. Minus 10% military buildings. So yeah, so kind of buildings generally work uh, worse here because our government doesn't reach here. Now, on the upside, if we go to our politics laws, when we're looking through for colonization institutions under economy, we have colonial exploitation right now. And that, apart from this, we talked about this tension, etc. So it gives, again, minus 10%. Yes, yeah, so we, we, we just saw that it gives minus 10% malice to subsistence output, manufacturing industries, minus percent wages in unincorporated states, but it does give a plus 20% throughput to Right. Plantations, mines, forestries, and rubber plantations. So basically, basic buildings actually work better here. And this is because we're kind of focused on exploiting these colonies, not developing them, not resettling them, just taking as much of the basic resources to feed our, you know, more industrialized, incorporated states. So that's something to consider. So, for example, every time we have a you know, coffee plantation here produces uh, your know, sort of throughput, what it does is that for the same wage, this building then takes in 20% more inputs and produces 20% more output. Now, in, a, in in plantations where there are no inputs, it's actually probably even more beneficial because we, for the same wage, uh, we produce more of the good. Uh, same for coffee, sugar, bananas, cotton, vineyards, uh, and wheat farms. So if we build logging camps here, for example, let's say as an option, they wouldn't actually produce 30 wood. They would produce 36 wood, right? Uh, so that's also something to think about and you know should we incorporate these or not so I guess if we did incorporate this who actually lives here 128,000 people but who are they they are 57,000 people they're peasants laborers farmers and so on so these people would be sort of enfranchised so we'd get some more aristocrats etc uh, they support landowners would become more powerful maybe rural folk Catholic Church uh, they're mostly Portuguese that lives here and some Afro-Brazilian Afro-Brazilians hmm, interesting uh, should we incorporate these or not what tax revenue would we get right we're only taxing 70% of income and we are bulk of our taxes really come from uh, um, a land tax on peasants and how many peasants are there here really 57,000, right? Not a lot. Not a lot at all. So, yeah, tax revenue, we're not really missing out a lot on, right? It would, it would take us 20 bureaucracy to service uh, the states just generally and kind of for general government administration and institutions, um, which we can afford. Uh, we would get a little bit of more tax revenue and they would be i don't think they would disturb our political system that much because they still support the same the same interest groups that our population does here given they're all portuguese so potentially 
potentially we could we could just incorporate them All right um, let's think about this while we're here is it worth incorporating them straight away or we could just you know, we have plenty of other unincorporated colonies that can produce cotton vineyards etc I guess they would benefit from higher population growth if we uh, extended our health institution here, right? That would be actually good for us. I mean, we will need, yeah, we can't really build much more here, yeah, to be honest, because we only have seven infrastructures so, and we're not going to build ports here, probably. So, yeah, well, actually, sorry, infrastructure. Yeah, we do need more infrastructure. So I'd probably actually go ahead and incorporate these. Yeah, we'll lose the 20% manufacturing throughput for these. But to be honest, maybe that's even a good thing because right now the price is so cheap that uh, you know, maybe a little less supply would actually be beneficial. Get a little bit of tax revenue, increase their population growth so that maybe later on we can actually build some and get some more infrastructure so we can actually build more than like one or two buildings here. It will cost us 20. Okay, let's let's keep this in mind. Perhaps we will. Let's have a look at Madeira quickly. 2% of our GDP, also 120,000 people, also unincorporated state, so suffering from all similar problems in terms of resources, also just fish and work, more of the logging camps, sugar, coffee, cotton, vineyards, wheat. No, not much. It does actually have a port even. Wow. Does Azores have a port? Yeah, it even has one port. Uh, oh, okay, but it's not actually switched to... Yeah, if we switch this to a cargo port, it will consume some clippers and provide us five more infrastructure, which is pretty good. Now again, similar dilemma here. So we could spend 40... 40... Uh, bureaucracy... for two years. Yeah, I think it's worth it, to be honest. I think it's good to raise their population growth here. Get the infrastructure prepped. Uh, okay. Let's think about, yeah, perhaps not. I mean, we're not going to be building anything there for the moment anyway. Yeah, I guess I'm thinking, like, it would be nice to build some logging camps here and just get that 20% throughput. But we will incorporate them eventually, I guess. We will, we are going to, so we, yeah, so that will cost us 40. All right, we are also uh, upgrading, sort of, or moving to a tier 2 colonial affairs institution. So that will take another 28. So it's, let's say, 30. So that's 70 bureaucracy gone. So we would actually have to build, you know, we would get healthcare soon as well. So we will have to build the government administration quite soon if we were to incorporate these. So let's maybe just hold off on that just for the second. Now here we have Portuguese Gambia, which is a colony. That's why it's called right? Portuguese Gambia. And we're slowly ca colonizing the state of Cabo. Right, so now colonies are special type of states. They're always unincorporated and we cannot incorporate it until colonization of the state is complete. Uh, it has taken a very long time, 11, 111,000 days, but basically a very long time. Um, let's have a look at the state. It's got 680,000 population just in our colony already. 7% uh, of our GDP actually is based here. Good amount of infrastructure, taxation capacity. It is a slit state with Gambia. So if we click on this, this is Cabo. Uh, I guess this whole state is just Gambia. So this is a state in Cabo. Cabo is the, uh, I guess the, the tribe here. Now if we click, yeah, if we click on them. So the way colonization works, you see it's a decentralized nation, a nation that share most properties of countries, pops, a ruler, buildings, law, and so on, but with a lack of centralized government and or will to enforce borders. This makes them prone to colonization by countries who do not see them as equals to be properly negotiated with for land rights. Decentralized nations are AI controlled and are not playable by humans. Yeah, so effectively, we can actually land and we'll have a look at that. We can go establish colony. You know, there's a bunch of African countries that have uh, this decentralized nations that we can just click on and just you know start landing our settlers there and encroach upon their land because it, as the description just said they're not they're decentralized nations so kind of local tribes with loose kind of central affiliation but no desire to enforce borders and that's what we are so you will see Cabo they're being colonized by Portugal 
They are themselves actually a slave state. There's malaria that's kind of there. Uh, so slowly we will encroach upon them until we take them over and then a colony will be established and then this will disappear and it will just be our a normal unincorporated state. Uh, we are taking over resources and population as we colonize, right? So we're not kind of killing anyone, we're just taking them over. This is what I talked about, it's got discoverable resources, so this is quite nice. Uh, you know, with uh, additional techs in the future, and with time, I guess this probably is like every week or so, uh, considering we have the necessary techs, there's a chance we will discover resources. Could be rubber, maybe here, not actually sure. Maybe some other special resource. Could be lead, could be sulfur, could be iron, coal. Uh, those are, I guess, I would assume we already ha would have discovered, but something kind of more mid-late game. Uh, like rubber, for example. Uh, but what do we actually have in Portuguese Gambia? No urban centers, no fishing. We just have two millet farms producing grains. Uh, that's it. Just a whole lot of subsistence orchards, right? They produce kind of fruit uh, and a whole bunch of other goods, including some grains for, uh, from the peasants. So you can see we're now calling you with 150,000 peasant workers, right? And that's where the 600,000 population comes from. If you look at the population here, 680,000, 600,000 peasants, all right? And when buildings, it only displays the workforce, so 150,000 peasants available to work. Um, yeah, and we have one port level in here as well. So that's Portuguese Gambia. Important note, I'm discoverable resources. So this is an important colony for us. Uh, or actually Cape Verde, we also own. Interesting, let's not skip over this. That's a 2% of our GDP, kind of similar to Azores and Madeira. 120,000 population, again, unincorporated, etc., etc. Just, again, very simple, just fishing wars and logging, some coffee, cotton, sugar. Yeah, so resource poor, population poor, just kind of minor islands. Okay, nice to have, I guess. Again, this dilemma, do we incorporate them or not? Um, perhaps we should, again, mostly Portuguese. We do want to grow kind of our Portuguese population generally so that we can later resettle them into colonies and make sure, you know, there's some social cohesion there. Uh, now, let's keep moving. So this, none of this is ours. At least not yet. Now we do have North Angola here, a state which you will notice uh, is clearly is used to be a colony but has now been fully colonized and therefore now it is just a normal unincorporated state. 7% of our GDP, 470,000 people live here not very well off um, some infrastructure taxation capacity some discoverable resources so that's good and that's important portuguese market access 100 percent some buildings here some potential for whaling stations on top of logging camps and fishing wharves which seems pretty much everyone has some whaling stations whaling stations produce uh, oil and meat so yeah it's kind of important it's a good one to have so we at least have some access to oil already now, in terms of agriculture here, however, we have plenty of arable land and we have potential for dye plantations here. Very good, right? Dyes, not many places in the world. I mean, there's, it's not definitely not few, but not many places can grow dyes and dyes are important for uh, textile manufacturing. Uh, it's hard to get them and it's hard to, well, it's like impossible to manufacture them synthetically until kind of late mid game and late game. Obviously, potential for coffee, millet, cotton, again, lots of tobacco, all the standard things. We have, even have some barracks here in a port, interestingly enough. Uh, Population-wise, it's really a Congo, so you very few Portuguese here, 0.7% only. So it's mostly local population still dominates, very, very few Portuguese. Um, interesting. Now, Portuguese South Angola. If we click on that, that is actually a colony and that is slowly encroaching upon uh, the kind of the full state of South Angola and the kind of the indigenous people of Ovimbundu. Obviously, it's going to take a long time. Again, we'll talk about how colonization works, but all the things we've seen uh, so far. Again, some whaling potential for just one whaling station here. Not a lot other than that. It's all coffee, cotton, get tobacco, all the standard, standard uh, kind of plantation. Kind of uh, sort of exotic uh, goods. I mean, at least if you're European. European. Now moving on to East Africa. Here we have Portuguese Lorenco Marques, and that is a split state with Lorenco Marques. And what is Lorenco? Wait, hang on. Where is Lorenco Marques? 
state in Gaza. Now what's happening here, so uh, clearly this used to be a colony, so we've colonized this little piece of the state of uh, Lorenzo Marquez, uh, but they, these Gazan people, this nation of Gaza has developed into a centralized nation, so we can no longer simply encroach upon their territory, right? They are now kind of up in arms, and they managed to gain you know, I guess some sort of centralized government, which does enforce borders, so now the only way to really take this over and, you know, unify this state, you know, and, and govern it as a single entity, we'd need to invade Gaza as we would any other country. That would involve a diplomatic play in which uh, any major empire that has an interest declared in this region or local countries, like for example Pretoria, would have a say and they might side with us or against us, uh, right? Or Gaza might just stand on its own against us and we can invade them, take them over and then join them up with the Portuguese Loeco Marquez. There are some discoverable resources here, so that's uh, good to know. 200,000 200, people here. Now in Gaza we have 746,000. Um, so that would be actually quite good to take over. Now what do we actually have here? So coal, logging camps and fishing wharves. We have some potential for coal, obviously, in the little piece that we have managed to colonize. We actually colonized the shoreline here as well. Otherwise it's all coffee, some dyes. So okay, potential for dyes here as well. Bananas, cotton, livestock ranches, obviously tea. That's quite nice, and we haven't seen that before. Uh, okay. Yeah, so that's Portuguese Lorenco Marquez. We also have to the north Portuguese Zambezia. Uh, right. State in Portugal. And so they are actually. What is Zambezia? Portuguese Mozambique. Uh, so I wonder. Yeah, so Mozambique's away. Yeah, so we're kind of growing this colony. Uh, but let's talk about Zambezia first. So again, all the things we've seen already. Plenty of infrastructure, a large population. Uh, what do we have? We have iron here. So this is important. Yeah, these are important. So that we can extract coal and iron from here to to fuel our industrialization efforts. They also have dyes. Uh, so banana, coffee, otherwise yeah, all kind of standard things. But a lot, a lot of variety, much more than in West Africa. So yeah, so this is something we should definitely focus on and prioritize these colonies perhaps taking over Gaza and licking up this sort of eastern Af East African coast. Population though, again, probably, well, apparently there's none. There isn't a single Portuguese person here. That is slightly worrying, to be really honest. Um, yeah, but we continue to colonize as neighboring states are still decentralized nations. This you know, kind of a collection of tribes of Manica and Mozam Mocambique, Mozambique. Um, here, so we continue to colonize them again, it's taken us a long time. Now let's have a look at Portuguese Mozambique here, again all the familiar things, 10% of our GDP, 360,000 people, it's a split state as we continue to colonize, in terms of buildings, no potential for any resources, mm, that's a shame, not much arable land either, what if we click on the kind of Mozambique proper, okay there's obviously much more, so when we take it all over, there's a lot of potential for plantations here, a lot. Uh, so yeah, so that should kind of be our strategic priority, I think, is to really finish up our colonies of uh, Gambia. All right, let's try to get Gambia, uh, South Angola, since we just started it. And yeah, as well as Lorenco, well, Lorenco Marquez, we're going to need to invade Gaza and unify the state that way, because they have now centralized. And But here, Portuguese Zambezia and Mozambique, we need to um, colonize now. Why does this? Why is this taking eleven thousand days? Well, first of all, colonization generally takes quite a bit of time. However, in Africa, and you know, no surprise why it remains, you know, very sparsely colonized. Right, the kind of European powers are just nibbling at the coastline. So far, it is because they have malaria, and malaria provides this malice of minus ninety percent colony growth speed in non-homeland states, and plus fifteen percent mortality in non-homeland states. Uh, so basically, we have 90% penalty to our colony growth. So this is taking 11,000. Now, with a, in 50 weeks, when we go up to Colonial Affairs 2, this will actually be halved, right? Because we're going to double our colonization speed. But what we should also do, and we'll talk about research in more detail, but if we go to society research, there's a tech called Quinine that will first unlock an extra level of co colonial affairs institution. It will also remove all effects from malaria in our own state colonies. 
in our own colonies and states, allow the estab establishment of colonies and states with severe malaria. Let's go ahead and kind of click that. I will go into more detail. We will need to research pharmaceuticals before that. And that is a tech that will give us, allow us to raise our health uh, care system by one level. So again, reducing mortality, improving standard of living on our lower strata. So boosting our population growth and then boosting our colonization efforts, making us hopefully, uh, you know, kind of on time in the race for Africa. Um, because I'm sure Britain, France and others, you know, will, uh, you know, start off to also grab uh, any land they can here. So let's focus on these. Now, otherwise, just do a quick, we only have kind of four minutes left of the episode. I can't believe time flies when you enjoy yourself, doesn't it? So we have a colony of Nova Goa here, 440,000 people, split state with Bombay. Not much we're going to be able to do about that, given this is controlled by Great Britain, the British Empire, which is by far the most powerful empire in the world. What do we have here? Again, dyes, not much resources, and a whole bunch of kind of, you know, exotic type goods. We also have a little colony of Macau here. Again, not much resources, a whole like a rice, dyes, whatever you want kind of 340,000. And we have the Portuguese Sunda Islands. This is not a colony anymore, so we've kind of gotten as much. It is a, still a split state with Sunda Islands, but we've taken a colonization here is finished. So it's between us and the Dutch, uh, East Indies, Sunda Islands. Uh, but again, it not very, very sparsely populated. It does have sulfur and iron, however, so we could, you know, could exploit this. And we could even potentially think about contesting that with the Dutch in the medium term. Yeah, the Dutch have really spread out in Southeast Asia. And that's about it. That's it for kind of an overview. And I think in terms of kind of general strategy, right, I guess. So we need to sort out unemployment and we need to reduce the price of wood in our market to alleviate the pressure from having to finance construction and expensive wood used in construction on our budget. Right. And also because these buildings are quick to build and provide, you know, good jobs for our unemployed. In terms of our technology, we'll research pharmaceuticals and quinine to speed up our population growth from, the, you know, from as soon as possible after the game starts and also boost our uh, colonial growth by removing that 90 percent penalty and also being you know, allowing us to upgrade our colonial uh, affairs institution by another level, going to 0 0.3 colonial growth right uh so it's another 50 percent increase we're now currently doing 100 percent increase another 50 percent increase and hopefully we race off right and try to grab as much land as we can as early as we can uh and see what we get from there so that's kind of the early strategy um okay still have an unpause after two hours of explanations but i think that will probably complete a kind of the general overview of the nation and where, what we own, what it is, and our, you know, I think our opening strategy is kind of set. We still need to decide if and when we incorporate, uh, right, Cape Verde, Azores, and Madeira and Mazores. Uh, we'll think about that. But otherwise, yeah, I think that's it for this episode, guys. Let's uh, hope you're enjoying it. Hope you learned something, and I hope that's given you a, a a good overview of Portugal if you want to play this country yourself. But also uh, has probably you know kind of given you a little. You know, an idea of how to evaluate a nation when you start a playthrough, right? What are its strengths, what are its weaknesses, right? Now we know Alenteo, for example, for us will be key to driving our industrialization. We need to be careful about infrastructure and population here. Madeira has unemployment. We'll need to sort that out by building kind of quick to build buildings that provide a good amount of jobs, right? We have our colonies here where we've looked at which colonies we should pursue, which one are kind of meh, I guess. Well, here there's a lot of dyes at least. I mean, for example, South Angola. Eh, we really don't see. What, what do we get? Like, not much. Not much is what we get, <laughs> I would say. This is, yeah, these are kind of good. They have some coal and iron at least, but Mozambique. Okay, I mean, it's huge. So, yeah, so that's at least positive. Uh, these ones kind of, okay, all sorts of exotic goods. We'll see. We'll see what best way to exploit it. Sunda Islands, also obviously sulfur and iron there. Uh, yeah. So I think that's it for now, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please give it a like. Just I'll just say this in the first few episodes. It really helps to get the series out there for the first few episodes and hopefully bring more people to Victoria 3 and help people, more people learn the game. Uh, help, helps me to grow the channel. But thanks all for watching, guys. I really appreciate it. Uh, excited for this playthrough and I hope to see you in the next episode. Bye for now.